introducing a new to us song today. It's been out on the radio for a number of years. It's called Because He Lives. I'm not sure if that's how it's pronounced yet. So I invite you to stay sitting for the first song and then rise to your feet for the second as you are able. And let's just enjoy praising God this morning. lights down. There we go. I believe in the sun. I believe in the risen one. I believe
this morning. Um, first of all, next Sunday is our summer schedule. So we'll have 9 a.m. worship, and Sunday school is over until next fall. Um, and then after worship next week is our reception for the Gould family celebrating their ministry here at St. Paul's. Um, and if you could just pass that along to people, uh, you know, we'll be putting it on social media, sending out emails, but if you could just let our friends know here at, from here at St. Paul's that our summer schedule begins next week. So just trying to make sure nobody shows up at 10 a.m. right as we're doing the benediction and um, just trying to avoid that situation. Um, also, I did want to mention that Bible Camp registration is open, uh, fybiblecamp.com, if you're interested in going to Bible Camp. Uh, kids from St. Paul's, um, all you have to pay is the registration fee, and St. Paul's is going to take care of the rest of your camp fee. So please register for Bible Camp. And then I wanted to call up uh, Brittany Hesterberg for a quick announcement also. Good morning. I was curious, how many of you attended a vacation Bible school when you were younger? If you've ever gone to VBS, look at all those hands. Isn't that awesome? Um, so if you've gone, I think you know that it's just a time of fun and faith and for us food since we do our dinner. Um, so I want to encourage you um, to be supporting the VBS that we have coming up here July 14th through July 18th. Um, so if you went to VBS, someone volunteered when you were a kid. Someone directed, someone taught, someone prayed, someone brought food in. And so I encourage you that if you're able to help with that, to please reach out to Vicki Maxwell um, or myself, so that way we can provide that for the kids in our community. Um, I'm excited. Registration's been open for not even a week, and we have 20 kids signed up already, and I've heard of a lot more. So we do need volunteers. We need someone to teach so we don't have to cut back stations. Um, we do need people to pray, and so Jen printed out on colored paper different prayer cards for you. So if you... Um, Want to grab those on your way out? They are in the back. So there's prayers for the families, the staff, for Vacation Bible School itself, and for the kids who attend. Um, so those are in the back. Grab some. Grab one of each when you leave. Um, and let Vicki or I know if you'd be willing to volunteer and make sure that you sign your kiddos up. So it's ages 3 through 8th grade in the fall, and that's in July. So um, thank you for supporting VBS. Please be praying for us. Be praying for the kids and their families. And we look forward to working with you. Thank you, Brittany and Vicki, for stepping up to lead our VBS this year. And yeah, I'd like to just reiterate that. If, if, you, um, if you feel that call to step out and teach or lead or kind of shepherd the kids around from station to station, we'd love to have you for Vacation Bible School. Um, today is our Graduate Recognition Sunday. Um, we have our graduates that were confirmed here at St. Paul's listed in your bulletin. Um, and just two of them are here today, this morning, and I wanted to recognize them specifically. Um, our first student, uh, if you were here on Easter, you got to hear Eli's testimony on the effect of him going to CHI the last couple years and what that is, how that has impacted him uh, ministering to God's children down in Mexico and just his heart for those kids and for mission. And uh, I just appreciate not only his testimony, but his living testimony as he serves the Lord. Our first senior this morning, if you give him a round of applause, is Eli Kennel. Hey guys, I'm Eli. Um, I'll be graduating Armstrong High School today, and um, in the fall I'll be, I will be attending the U of I. Um, so far, some of my favorite memories here at church has been attending the Mexico mission trips. So thank you. And then our last student is Becca, and um, gee, many. <laughs> um, Having Becca and her boyfriend Caleb with me in youth group is like having another set of adults with us. Um, and so I do want to recognize Caleb also. For the last two years, if Becca's at youth group, Caleb is at youth group. And if we were working somewhere, I could be like, I'm going to stay with the kids. You guys go get pizzas. Or you guys keep an eye on the kids, and I'll go get the pizzas. Or you keep an eye on the boys at kids club, and I'll do the girls. It was like having adults with me for the last two years. Um, I did the math, and over the last nine years, because I let Becca join junior high youth group when she was in fourth grade. Um, 
Over the last nine years, Becca and I have served over 20,000 people together. Um, God is good. Um, they're going to give their favorite memories, or Becca is, and my, my favorite memory was every week that we would cook cinnamon rolls, Becca would get up at 6 a.m. to cook cinnamon rolls with me, ever since she was in fourth grade. And last week, we cooked cinnamon rolls for her FCA group for her final meeting in high school with her group. And uh, I'm like, oh, go ahead and get ready, come by at, at quarter to seven, pick up the cinnamon rolls, I'll cook them. And uh, she said, no, I, got, I want to do this one last time with you. And got up early and cooked cinnamon rolls with me. And today is a hard day. <laughs> our, our last senior is Becca Maxwell. My name is Becca Maxwell. Oh, I can't follow that up. <laughs> I am graduating from Randall Township High School next week, and, um, and I'm, my plans are to attend Parkland College uh, for the next two years, so I'll still be here serving and um, planning to major in elementary education. And my favorite memories have just been serving alongside my best buddy. Let's pray together. Gracious and Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for our graduates, and we thank you for your faithfulness. Lord, as, as these kids get ready to graduate, we, we remember when they were baptized. We remember when they were in preschool. We remember when they were in Sunday school and VBS, as Brittany just said. Your faithfulness is just on display as we celebrate these graduates today. Lord, we also ask that you be present in our worship today. Uh, this is a graduation day, but Lord, this is your day above all else. So help us to honor you, Lord to celebrate you, Lord, to give thanks to you, Lord. Now, this is the day that the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. So give us that spirit as we worship together in spirit and in truth. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the great gifts that you give us. As on days like today where we look back and we celebrate, Lord, we celebrate your goodness. We celebrate your grace. And Lord, we ask for your blessing upon this service today. Lord, we ask your blessing upon this day today. May our thoughts, may our actions, may our words glorify you, Lord Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. And would you all please stand for the confession printed in your bulletin. Merciful God and Heavenly Father, whose grace endures to all generations, you are patient and long-suffering and will forgive the sins and transgressions of those who truly repent. Look with compassion upon your people and hear their supplications. We have sinned against you and are unworthy of your goodness and love. Remember not our transgressions, have mercy upon us and help us, O God. Grant us remission of all our sins and grant us the grace of your Holy Spirit that we may amend our ways and with you obtain everlasting life through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. You may be seated and grab your Bibles as we have the scripture readings. Our first scripture reading for today is found in Isaiah chapter 12, verses 1 through 6. Isaiah chapter 12, beginning with the first verse. Then you will say on that day, I will give thanks to you, O Lord, for although you were angry with me, your anger is turned away, and you comfort me. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid, for, for the Lord God is my strength and song, and he has become my salvation. 
Therefore, you will joyously draw water from the springs of salvation, and in that day you will say, Give thanks to the Lord and call on his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Make them remember that his name is exalted. Praise the Lord in song, for he has done excellent things. Let this be known throughout the earth. Cry aloud and shout for joy, O inhabitant of Zion, for great in your midst is the Holy One of Israel. Our second scripture reading is from Romans chapter 11, verses 17 through 24. Romans chapter 11, starting with the first verse, starting with the 17th verse. But if some of the branches were broken off, and you, being a wild olive, were grafted in among them and became partaker with one of the rich root of the olive tree, do not be arrogant toward the branches, but if you are arrogant, remember that it is not you who supports the root, but the root supports you. You will then say, branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. Quite right, but they were broken off for their unbelief, but you stand by your faith. Do not be conceited, but fear, for if God did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either. Behold, then the kindness of the severity of God to those who felt severity, but to you, God's kindness, if you continue in his kindness, otherwise you will also be cut off. And they also, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. For if you were cut off from what is by nature a wild olive tree, and you were grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these, who are the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? Our third scripture reading is found in Colossians chapter 1, verses 19 through 23. Colossians chapter 1, beginning with the 19th verse. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness of, to dwell in him, and through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Through him I say, whether things on, this, on earth or things in heaven. And although you were formerly alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds, yet he has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death in order to present you before him and blameless and beyond reproach, if indeed you continue in the faith firmly established and steadfast and not moved away from the hope of the gospel that you have heard, which is proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, was made a minister. This is the reading of God's word. May God bless the reading and the hearing of his word. Please stand as we give ourselves and offerings to God. And you may be seated together. I'd invite you to take up the seven by seven prayer guide and let's continue together going to the Lord in prayer. Father, we do together individually, but even corporately today, we would invite you, Jesus, come into our hearts. Come in today, Lord Jesus. Come in in a new way, in a refreshing way. 
Come into our hearts, Lord Jesus. And Father, we ask for the outpouring of your Holy Spirit upon each one of us today, upon all the children gathered here, upon all the young people. Lord, we ask even for those students that are already done with school, whether eighth graders that have graduated, seniors that are ending their time at high school, or even the rest of the students that are getting ready to be done with the year. Lord, I pray for each one of them and for the rest of us this summer that you would, and even right now, that you would call us to be students of your word. Oh God, let it be that even today would be marked as a day that we began to personally read your word. That this week would be a, a new week of reading and studying and growing in the knowledge of you, O oh God, God of our salvation. Lord God, as we're here right now, we thank you for St. Paul's Lutheran Church. We thank you for all of those who call this church home. And we ask today that you would fill each one with the spirit of encouragement and enthusiasm and readiness to follow you, Jesus. Lord, we pray for each one of our family members today, and we pause right now to pray specifically for members of our church, members of our families, even our friends, and we ask you, God, to hear us as we intercede on behalf of others right now. And Father God, as we're here today, gathering together to worship you, we pray on behalf of the persecuted church, and specifically we pray today on behalf of the church in Colombia. And Lord God, as many of those churches have faced persecution over the years and over the decades, we pray today for strength for the pastors, strength for the leaders and their families, strength for all of the born-again Christians in Colombia. Would you gather them together in a spirit of unity and purpose, that they would continue to be builders of your kingdom in Colombia and as you call them. Lord God, we continue to pray for Brian Zifang and Jesus is the Way prison ministry here in Rantoul. We give you thanks for the ministry to the men who are currently living there at Jesus is the Way. And we pray that you would open up the doors for other additional men to join and to be growing in the grace and in the knowledge of Jesus. Lord God, we thank you for the AFLC. Specifically, we thank you for Newark Lutheran Church. We pray for Pastor John Benson. We ask that you'd encourage him in his endeavors at the church in Newark and also in his endeavors with the AFLC as he serves on boards and committees. Strengthen John today. And Father God, hear us as we pray the prayer, Lord Jesus, that you've taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Greater far than 
It is always so good to sing about the love of God, amen? Amen. To learn about the love of God, to look for the love of God, to recognize the love of God. Well, this morning, as we turn to Romans 11, I want to invite you to turn with me there. And as we go through parts of this chapter, not really going to be able to cover all uh, 11 Uh, all of chapter 11 today, otherwise we'd probably be here for hours into maybe Tuesday or Wednesday if we were going to try that, Uh, and we could be camping out here like many people are camping out in tents on college campuses, right? We could almost do that right here. Sue's saying, no, we're not going to do that. We're not spending the night. Uh, While we're going through the sermon, I want to invite you to do something in your sermon notes today, a little different. I'm going to give you a few words, and you can be kind of like a word find, but more of a theology find. I want to invite you to not uh, leave school here today. Many of you students are almost done or getting done. Rebecca, are you done with school, like done? Okay, today you're, you're back in. You're back in school. Let's be in school together. We're going to look for these words and really the heartbeat of God in Romans 11, helping us understand some of these big theological words. So here's the first word. You can write it down. And as we go through the sermon, you can be writing notes about this word, how the word of God helps you understand, first of all, evangelism. What is Paul teaching us? What is the spirit of God wanting to help us with the reality of evangelism? How about the second word, sanctification? What is God's heart for you in you being sanctified or being made holy, growing in holiness. The third word is is Israel. What is God's word? What is Paul teaching us about Israel today? And we could go on and on, but one more word is the word grace. What is God teaching us today about His grace? You have sermon notes, and so you can be following along with those as well. Uh, giving you two opportunities to be plugging into the Word of God and learning. Well, many of you know it's planting season, and for some of you farmers, you would say, I wish it was done. I wish it still wasn't. How many of you are not done with planting season? That's, that, okay, we got a few here that are not done, and many of you, all of you would say, we should already be done. Last year's calendar, we were already done. Um, how many of you are going to plant a garden this year? How many of you are going to plant a garden? Anybody done? Okay, no, Jim is done. He is done. Hats off to to Jim. None of us have hats on, but anyway, so the saying goes. Well, planting season, whether you're planting a garden with vegetables or a flower garden, even farming, it's somewhat of an experiment, right, that's reliant upon the goodness of God, reliant upon the favor of God, but there's a little bit of experimenting. You know, you kind of 
in a backyard flower garden. You cut a little bit off here, you put a little bit there, and you just, voila, you have a beautiful flower garden, right? Isn't that how it goes every year? Voila! No, there's failure. Things die. They get a disease, and they're just done, and it doesn't always work. And it can be kind of disappointing as we go through the growing season. It can just be filled with, ah, oh, disappointment. Well, in our lives, one of my, well, my, my daughter said that volleyball is all about, the game of volleyball is all about mistakes. It's all about failure and learning to adapt to mistakes and failure. One, one, many of us have said, life is about learning from your mistakes, right? A part of life is just learning from your mistakes. This morning, I think the, the big banner would be, let's be ones who are learning from the success of Jesus. Maybe you want to write that down for your life motto. My life is all about learning and growing in the success of Jesus. How about that for a life identity, purpose, mission? I want to be learning and growing in the success of Christ Jesus, my Savior. Maybe one more word that you can write in the margin that you're going to be searching for. I just found this word on my sheet. How about repentance? How about if we're learning about learning from the Word of God this morning about repentance? Well, one sure thing we're going to see today, you've already probably seen it, is, is failure because of human sin. It's a daily reality. You don't have to look back very far. If you go back in your calendar, go back in your week, go back in your year to see, oh my goodness, oh, there's some sin staining my life. There's some stin- sin staining my relationship. Some sin staining my attitude. And so repenting in our relationships, repenting most importantly in our relationship with God and then in our relationship with each other, repenting is turning back. So right now, with that in mind, would you pray with me and then we're going to continue. Father, we, we humble ourselves. We want to learn from you today. We want to learn from your word. And so, Holy Spirit, we acknowledge you as our counselor. Oh, Jesus Christ, would you teach each one of us? Father God, we humble ourselves right now under your mighty hand. And we invite you to nurture our hearts today with your word. Nurture our hearts in the name of Jesus Christ. May our lives continue to be planted in and growing from the success of Jesus. May our lives continue to be rooted in your success, Jesus, for we pray in your name. And everyone agreed and said, so be it, Lord. Amen. Well, the first point in your notes there is the failure of humanity. (laughs) How about that for a fun place to start? Is man's Woman's, humans, it's human sin. The failure of humanity is my sin, our sin. That's the failure of humanity. If your Bibles are open, let's just dig right into the middle of Romans 11, starting with verse 11. Paul asks, so I ask, did they, the Jews, the people of God, the chosen people, did they stumble in order that they might fall? And so Paul's really asking a simple question. What is the consequence of the unbelief of the Jews? Not just the Jews that yelled crucify him. Not just the chief priest that slapped and spat upon and punched Jesus. He's not just, Paul's not just asking about those Jews. He's looking all the way back. All the way back. Going back through the entire Old Testament and looking at his people. And he... uh, Any question about Paul, uh, look look at verse 1 in Romans 11. I ask then, has God rejected his people? By no means, for I myself am an Israelite. And so we need to be aware of the fact that Paul's not judging some other group. He's actually asking about his people, his family, his ancestors. Paul's writing from an attitude of humility. 
Paul's asking the question, what is the consequence of the unbelief, the hardness of heart for the people of Israel, the Jews? These are God's chosen people, and sadly, we can see the story, and we can see the reality even today, the writing of Jews today, many who are not believing, not receiving the Word of God, denying, most importantly, and emphatically denying Jesus Christ. What's the consequence? Let's continue to read in Romans 11, verse 11. So I ask, repeating what we already read, did they stumble in order that they might fall? By no means. Notice the heart of God. By no means, that's not God's heart, that they would fall. Rather, through their trespass, the sin of the Jews, salvation has come to the Gentiles. So that as to make Israel jealous. Notice this. The Jews turned away from God and God raised up Paul and Peter and the rest of the apostles, sent them out and then brought in the Gentiles and helped them turn to Jesus. That's what Paul's talking about right here. Look at verse 12. Now, if there, the Jews, trespass means riches for the world, and if their failure means riches for the Gentiles, notice this, how much more will their full inclusion mean? I want you to hear right in here, this is the story of the prodigal son who left his father's house, realized This is a wretched life. I used to live in my father's home and now I'm eating with pigs. He would at least allow me to be a servant. And notice the prodigal son, Jesus tells what happens when a person turns back to the goodness of God the Father. They're received back in. That's what Paul's saying right here. How much more will the Jews' full inclusion be if they would just simply turn to Jesus? Some of yours and my, some of our biggest reasons for failure in our lives is because we, I for sure, I do at times confuse my identity with my achievements, who I am with what I've done or what I'm doing. And at times then we can even confuse our identity with our assignment in life. This is who I am This is what I'm supposed to do. This is what I'm called to do. This is my job. This is my title. There can be confusion there. One author, your church council members, Gary and I, we've been reading the Titus 10 by J. Josh Smith, looking at the biblical characteristics of a godly man. J. Josh Smith writes, Those who do not know their true identity get into a cycle of comparing, coveting, and competing. Oh, doesn't that just cause us to go, yep, that can be me. At times when I forget who I am, and as I'm wrestling with what I'm doing, I can begin to look at other people forgetting who I am, comparing and coveting and then competing. It's a lot of human struggle. Think about Jacob and Esau. Think about Cain and Abel. Think about Joseph and his brothers. All of those brothers struggled with comparing, competing, and coveting. Seems like a human issue. When we get confused about who we are, we can start comparing ourselves with others. Competing. Coveting. The ultimate failure in anyone's life, whether they're Jew or whether they're a Christian, the ultimate failure is when we turn away from God, away from His Word, and away from His will. And there's a slippery slope, just a little whisper come over here. No one's watching. Come over here. You deserve it. Come over here. You're better than they are. Come over here. You can be recognized if you. First point in your notes is the failure of humanity is man's sin. The second point in your note is the rejection of the unbelievers. And I apologize for the apostrophe S. It's not supposed to be there, so you can cross that out. The rejection of the unbeliever by God's will. I don't like this point. It's not mine, really. It's the point that we get from Paul. The rejection of an unbeliever according to or by God's will. And so we begin asking a question Has with Paul. Paul's asking, has God rejected 
the Jews, as you watch the news today and you see Israel in the spotlight at times, has God rejected them? That's a good question for us. Look then back, we already looked at it, look again at verse 1. I ask, Paul's asking, has God rejected his people? This made it into the book. This is an important question that God wants you and I to be wrestling with. Has God rejected his chosen people? What does Paul say? He answers the question, by no means can a father lovingly, I don't know, can we reject men, dads? Can we reject our kids? I'm seeing some of you say, well, maybe, maybe tomorrow. Depending upon the true heart of a loving father, renewed by the grace of God, rooted in the success of Jesus, never rejects his son or daughter. No, 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 no. Discipline, yes. Reject, no. Allow them to reap what they've sown, yes, but reject, absolutely not. Paul says, by no means. And God the Father is our standard for fatherhood and motherhood, actually. So, we ask, has God rejected the Jews? Another question, from this question, has God rejected the United States of America today? Some of you would say emphatically, yes, and I'm watching it. Careful. Careful. To answer that question, write down this address, look it up later. 1 Timothy 2 verse 4, we read, it is God's will that all men will be saved, and very importantly, not just saved, and come to a knowledge of the truth. 1 Timothy 2 4. And it's because of that heart of God, His will is that all people would be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. Are you hearing the heartbeat of evangelism in God the Father? Here you go. You can write some notes down about what is the heartbeat of the evangelist. It's 1 Timothy 2 4. It's God's will. If it's God's will, then what is my role? If I'm reading the will of my Father in heaven, what is my job description? What is my calling? What am I to be about? What is my prayer life to look like? If God's will is that everyone would be saved, what should I be doing with my neighbors that I don't like, that I'm offended by? They mow my side of the yard. I was going to say something, but I'm not going to. 1 Timothy 2, 4, it is God's will that all men would be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. And then right with that, John 3, 16, for God so loved and loves the world. But it was in his love that he gave Jesus that whoever would believe in Jesus would be saved, would inherit eternal life. And then right with that, right coming out of John 3, 16, we have Acts 2, 17, on the front of your bulletin cover, the Holy Spirit was poured out on all flesh. And yes, it's Pentecost Sunday, and we celebrate the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on all flesh, Jews, Gentiles, helping the church in every country, helping missionaries go all around the world, bringing the knowledge of Jesus that whoever would turn will be saved, even the Jew. But, turn with me now and look at Romans 11, verse 17. But if some of the Jews, the branches, the unbelieving Jews, the Jews with a hardness of heart, the Jews that are living in rebellion, living with closed eyes, if some of them were dead with unbelief, were broken off, and you, Gentile, non-Jew, who Paul describes as an, a wild olive shoot, were to be grafted in among the others. What now? How is this possible? How is it possible that Jewish people born into the promises and the covenants of God, how could they be broken off from Israel? What is God saying? How could they be broken off? Well, there's a consequence of sin. The Bible tells that all over the place. The consequence of sin is what? Yeah, it's death. But notice what Jesus said in John 15. 
I am the vine. You are the... My father is the gardener, and he cuts off every branch in me that is bearing no fruit. God, his will is the rejection of the unbeliever. And I don't know about you, but that makes me sorrowful. Does that make you sorrowful? Does that make your heart grieve? Unbelieving, that unbelieving nature in our heart, that rebellion that's all around the world, that rejection of the unbelieving Jews by God, where does it start? It doesn't start with God rejecting them. It starts with unbelief, working with sin, leading to a a rebellious hardness of heart and a rejection of God by that Jewish man or woman, that little boy that's raised in a Jewish home that doesn't believe in God, rather wants to follow the patterns of this world. Does that sound like Christian children too sometimes? Does that sound like me sometimes? What happens in the heart of a Jewish individual can happen in the heart of a Christian raised individual that we have this willingness to accept temptation into our lives and invite it and allow it to produce a heart that's willing to sin leading to a habit of sin which leads to the hardness of heart and the turning away from the grace and the knowledge of Jesus. Sin is that poison in your heart and mine and that poison it, it deceives, it, it corrupts, it hardens, it blinds, it darkens, it enslaves, it kills. And so look again back at verse 17. And you, although a wild olive shoot, were grafted in to Christ among the other believers, and now share in the nourishing root, sharing in the root of the olive tree. But do not be arrogant toward the branches. If you are, remember, it is not you who supports the root. How many of you would possibly say that at times pride is raised up in your heart that you thought God was really benefiting from you? <laughs> Yeah, we've been there. We've been proud. But Paul says, do not be arrogant toward the other branches. Don't be arrogant toward those who have turned away from God. Because if you are, look at verse 18. It is not you who supports the root, but the root supports you. Who's the root? Some commentators were pointing to Jesus. I think the root is the Lord God Almighty. And I think the root supports the vine who is Christ. And Jesus said, I am the vine and you are the branches. Look at verse 19. Then you will say, branches were broken off so that I might be granted, grafted in. That is true. They were broken off because of their unbelief, but you stand fast through faith. So do not become proud, but fear the Lord. Fear God. Revere, worship God, love God with all of your heart. That holy fear that the Bible talks about is a a heart that's just filled with a holy, reverent fear of love of God. Verse 21, for if God did not spare the natural branches, be careful, Christians. If God did not spare the natural branches in their unbelief, in their rebellion, Paul gives us a very strong caution. Do you read it? He will not spare you either. You and I in Christ have been accepted into God's family. How? How? It's by grace. Look with me at verse 6. And even 5 and even 4. Even three, go back there. Lord, they've killed your prophets, the Jews have. They've demolished your altars, and I am alone left. This is Elijah talking to the Lord. And they seek my life, Jezebel and the other, all the prophets are going to kill me. But what is God's reply to Elijah? I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. So too at the present time, there is a, what is that word? A remnant. If you at times are worried that you're all alone in your faith, remember this word. God preserves for himself a remnant. 
And he's calling you and I to join with that remnant Chosen, what does it say, how? By their works? Chosen by their wealth? Chosen by all their efforts? Chosen by? Chosen by grace. Look at verse 6. But if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. We've been accepted into God's family by grace. Notice Paul's language here and the title of our sermon is grafted in. Have any of you ever grafted in a a living shoot into another tree or vine? How many of you have done that before? Just curious. Tried, Tried and failed. Okay, that's like evangelism sometimes. I'm trying to help bring someone to Jesus. Tried and failed. Bradley, did you succeed? Okay, we've got... Good, good work. We're trying. Anybody succeed with grafting something in? Kind of an experiment. A, a biology sermon experiment. Let's, let's try some grafting in this summer, maybe. It requires, amazingly, two living things. I kind of wanted to just take one of the branches from the grass and bring it in. and No, it's got to be living. Two living things can be grafted in and grow. How does that work? It's a miracle. The grafting in that Paul's talking about where you and I were grafted into Jesus is a miracle. It's not by our work. It's by grace. Grafted in. How are we made alive? We were dead in our sin. We were made alive by being given the gift of faith. The Holy Spirit at work. Revealing Jesus Christ. Producing a heart of faith. And receiving Jesus miraculously grafted in by God's grace into Jesus, into the vine. Ultimately, our life source is because He died. Miraculously, supernaturally, God in His decision, His will is to give faith to some. I don't understand why. Someone asked this morning, why doesn't God give faith to all? (laughs) I don't know the answer. It's God's will. It's God's choice. You and I need to respond to Him with fear. Shaking. Humility, with a willing, teachable, flexible heart, we're grafted into that olive tree, the people of God, the family of God. We're grafted into Israel. And you and I, together with all the Jews who are believing today, following Jesus Christ as Savior, we're a part of God's chosen people. Notice this, every human is God's creation, amen? But not every human is a part of God's family, amen? I'm wondering how many people didn't want to say amen to the second one. Because I think there are people in most churches that want to believe that every single human is a part of God's family. The only way that we're a part of the family is if we're grafted into the vine. If we're grafted into Jesus by faith. Trusting in his work. That he died to pay for our sin. Look at verse 16, would you please? It says... At the end of verse 16, if the root is holy, so are the branches. Can you say that out loud with me? If the root is holy, so are the branches. There you see the miraculous working of being grafted into the vine of Jesus. You might say, but my life is not holy. I don't belong. God's probably cut me off because I've been living a sinful life. Notice the miraculous working of God, even with failures like me. We're grafted into Jesus, and our life is based upon the success of Jesus. Ultimately, it's the success of God the Father. His perfection makes us perfect through Christ. Notice he's the mediator between God and us. God is perfect. Jesus died, the perfect sacrifice to pay. And then you and I get to be made perfect through Jesus. I hope you see it. I hope your eyes are opened. I hope this propels you to be evangelists, to be one who would willingly tell other people the way of salvation, pointing to Jesus Christ. I hope this morning that you're seeing the fruit of sanctification. It's as your life is in Christ with the root being the holy God of creation, the life source being Jesus Christ, the resurrected one who died on the cross, his blood shed to pay for your sin, and you willingly grafted in, his blood becomes your life source. And therefore you're made holy as you're filled with the Holy Spirit, producing fruit. There's the sanctification picture. There it is. There it is. If the root is holy, 
then the root will make the unholy branches holy that are grafted into Christ. It says if the root is holy, but how else can we define the root? How else can you define God the Father? He's holy, but he's also love. He's also good. He's also merciful and kind, and he's long-suffering. He's just very patient. You can turn to 1 Corinthians 13 and look at what is agape love. It's all the qualities that Paul lists. You can go through the whole Bible. Who is God? You find him on every page. Yes, he's holy without sin. Look at point number three in your notes, the kindness of grace by God's power. Don't really like that point exactly. It's kind of messy, but see it there. See it come alive in your heart, the kindness of grace. It mathematically makes sense that we would reward good works. It, it, it just it makes sense. It's just. If you do good work, you're going to get a reward. But notice the kindness of grace where God gives to you His love and His Son gives to you Himself, His promises, gives to you His presence, <coughs> gives to you His life, His everlasting life. It's it's by grace, which is very kind, the kindness of grace. It's by God's miraculous, supernatural power. It's not mathematical the way you and I want it to be. It's like I want 2 plus 2 to always equal 4. But with God, it's like my sin plus Jesus equals I'm alive and I'm growing and I'm fruitful. All because of God's kindness in His grace, by His supernatural power. Look at verse 22 with me. Note, then the kindness and the severity of God. Severity towards those who have fallen. Do you, do you see the sternness of God here? Do you see the discipline of God here? Do you see He's serious? He's just. Note the kindness and the severity of God. The severity towards those who have fallen, but God's kindness to you provided that you continue in His kindness. Otherwise, you too will be cut off. Verse 23, and even then, if they, the Jews, do not continue in their unbelief, they too will be grafted back in, for God has the power to graft them in again. That's why there's the organization, the Jews for Jesus. And that's why they're not just in America. They're in Israel. The Jews for Jesus are trying to lead Jews and Gentiles, but they're missionaries to the Jewish people to call them come back to God through Jesus. Look at verse 24. For if you were cut off from what is by nature a wild tree, that's you and I that were born from just a, a non-believing we were born into a non-believing family. We were in, our parents, or we were introduced to Christ, and we were grafted in. That's what Paul's talking about. If you were cut from what is by nature a wild olive tree and grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these, the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? Note, then, the kindness of of God. We began this morning talking about that life is about learning from our mistakes. I think a better statement is that our life would be about, as Christians, learning about the success of Jesus Christ. Your life this week, learning to be about, learning from the success of Jesus, living from the kindness of God's grace. We read already in Isaiah chapter 12, verse 2. You can write that down and go back and look. I'm going to sing it for you. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For the Lord my God is my strength and my song. He also has become my salvation. La, 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 la. Did you hear the tambourine? La, 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 la. I could go on and on and on. Behold, God is our salvation. Tomorrow in the middle of whatever's going on in your world, 
I will trust him and not be afraid. Amen? I want to ask you to pray with me this morning as we continue. Father God, we thank you for your kindness to us. We thank you for your grace to us. We thank you for grafting each one of us in. Thank you this morning for teaching us a little bit about evangelism, a little bit about sanctification, a little bit about Israel. Oh God, let it be that we would walk out today full of your grace and full of your truth in Christ Jesus. For we pray in your name, Lord. Amen. There's a closing hymn for us to sing. I want to encourage you to stand with your red celebration hymnal and turn to number 338 as we stand and sing about the wonderful grace of Jesus. I want to invite you to stand as we sing. All right, we are going to have some fun. Or as Pastor likes to say, we're going to have some forced fun this morning. So we've been learning about the grace of Jesus, and it is just wonderful. It's beyond our concept. But this morning, we're going to close our worship service singing about the wonderful grace of Jesus. And so when we get to the bottom of the first page where it says refrain, we're going to split. We're going to divide and conquer. So the men, if you notice at the very bottom line, it says men unison. All of the men sing with dad. That's He's me. going to be... <laughs> That's going to be your song. Ladies and everybody else that can't sing the men's side, we're going to follow Cindy. I'm going to maybe sit a little bit in between there, but we'll, we'll see what happens. But we're going to have fun, and we're going to praise the Lord. Wonderful the 
matchless grace of Jesus, deeper than the mighty rolling sea, higher than the mountains, sparkling like the fountain, all sufficient grace for even me, broader than the scope of my transgression, sing it, greater far than all my sin and shame, my sin and shame. Oh, magnify the precious blood of Jesus, praise His name. Amen. Yeah, praise His name. Would you receive these last words from the near end of Romans chapter 11, verse 33? Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are His judgments and how inscrutable His ways. And finally, verse 36, for from Him and through Him and to Him are all things. He's the root, right? To Him be glory forever. Amen. Amen. It's fellowship time. Would you love one another?